Oh my God! Stay tuned. The show is about to begin. The show is about to begin. <laughs> we are waiting for my friend to come in. Let's see. Let's see if anybody is here today for Barsha, Barsha, Barsha. And I am going to send my invitation to my special guest today. And let's see if he comes in. This is very exciting. All right. We are on episode 52, and it looks like it's going to be our final show for Barsha, Barsha, Barsha. Because things are changing at Fireside, and uh, this is what's happening now. Things change, things move on, and uh, you got to go with change, right? You got to go with change. There's Chris Rossetti. Stay tuned. I can't believe this is my last show. And it was... Anyway. So I'm going to see if I can get my my incredible... Hi, Chris. I'm going to see if I can get my guest in here. Let's see. Let us see if we can uh, get him in our last show. I can't believe it. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Well, he's not in here. I maybe I would have to call him. Hi, everybody! Oh my God! All my friends are here. I can't see if my uh. This is just. Stay tuned. The show is about to begin. All right, I'm going to check him, and see if he's here. I don't really know where he is. So let's just, cause this is, there's Mitchell. There he is. All right, Mitch, can you come up on stage? Chris Rossetti, can you help me bring Mitchell? Oh, there he is. Oh my God. Yay. We want to, Yes! Can you hear me, Mitchell Foreman? I can, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I have a song for you. This is our last show. You are here for the last show on Fireside. Oh my God. I'm hey, Dad, so excited. Tell me one second. I'm, I have these headphones. Tell me if it sounds better, me just talking into the mic or using these headphones. Hold on. This is All right. Is better right, or let worse? Let me hear it. Say something. Better or worse? Uh, Actually, better, but I'm actually hearing myself in an echo. But let me say, oh. talk again. Yes, one, two, three. Checking, one, two, three. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. not great. Can I sing you my song? This is the final time I'm going to be singing my Fireside song. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. Excited. Here we go. Where do you... <laughs> my final side. Where do you go on Mondays when you want to have fun? Well, where can you go on Mondays when your day is done? Fireside Chat is where it's at. Our guests are all the best. I can't find anything to rhyme with your last name but Norman. So let's welcome him. Here's Mitch Foreman. Help me in welcoming Mitchell Foreman. Oh my God, wow. I did it. That's so good. Deb, I didn't work on my lighting here. I'm pretty dark. Is this all right? No, your lighting is fine. Listen, yes. this we were just notified that we're not going to be broadcasting anymore. Oh, you told Maybe, me. Maybe it's very upsetting because uh, I have this is my 52nd show on Fireside. And just to be doing it with you is just amazing. Uh, so thanks, Deb. let it's me a year, let me just 52. And you're doing it on Yom Kippur, which is very important. That is true. I am doing it. <laughs> We are atoning together on Yom Kippur. 
I uh, wish I did have better lighting on you, but we'll just have to yeah, do yeah, it. I can uh, look for better lighting here. I'm sort of, uh, let's see. Let us okay. see. We also, while you're trying to find better lighting, I just want to tell you that Martha Barsha is here. It's a very oh special. Oh, my goodness. I love Martha Barsha. Martha Barsha happens to be. How's that? That looks better. That does look pretty damn good. All right. right. Let me explain to everybody for my episode 52, final episode of Barsha, 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 that um, we have a special guest. This is Mitchell Foreman. He was born in Brooklyn, New York, which I didn't know, started studying classical piano at age seven. And at 17, he entered the Manhattan School of Music for three years of study. And then he just started working. Is that right? Pretty close. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about what his first job was. Are we ready for you jazz aficionados? Yeah. Uh, Jerry Mulligan, uh, Stan what? Getz, and then your solo career just blossomed in 1980. That's basically what it is. Is that the trajectory? Uh, let's talk there's about a, that first. There's a little bit missing from there. Okay, please, let's go. Not from when you said, Mommy, I want to be a musician. Right. We'll go to no, that I think my the- first real gig was Frankie Valley, which is weird. I didn't know that. Yeah, you didn't know. Like 19, I think it was before the other jazz gigs was Frankie Valley. Wow. And so you played all Can't Take My Eyes Off You, all All the big hits? All that stuff. All that stuff, yeah. Actually, when I did it, when I did it, he had a number one hit. He had Grease. Grease is the word, is the word. B flat minor, yep. All right, thank you. I don't know what key I just sang it in. I don't know what you sang. I know the original was Beef Hunter. I'm not sure where you were. <laughs> How do you re- see musicians retain that in their brains? Like, okay, I remember Greece, Frankie Valley, Beef Flat Minor. Because <laughs> we played it so much. <laughs> okay, look, I'm so excited to be talking with you for my final show. Okay, so let oh, so now, okay, you graduate from Manhattan School of Music. What happened in school that made you realize I got to get, did you ever graduate? Cause I didn't. I did. You know, it's funny. I graduated with a degree, like not, I didn't take academics Okay. because I thought I was better than the school's academics. And I wound up taking calculus at Columbia, which kicked my butt. And then I said, Oh, I'm not doing it anymore. And this last summer, I just finished my bachelor's degree at university of Las Vegas. I calculated it. Took, it took, it's, <laughs> You're funny, Deb. 49, 49 years to get a bachelor's degree. But you've been teaching at colleges. How are I've they? Te- I'm teaching. They just let us. Well, I have a degree technically, so but it's just not a bachelor's. But I'm teaching master's courses coming up this fall. So, okay, you have just inspired me because I was thinking of finishing my bachelor's. So you're saying you can just go, okay, because I have life experience, as we both know. We have right. life experience. Yeah, no, but I didn't, get any, I didn't get anything for the life experience. I, had a fr- I did some work at the University of Las Vegas. Shout out to Tom Leslie, who runs the Wind Ensemble. And I wrote a piece for him. And uh, he said, we can make it easy for you to get your degree. And he kind of lied because it really wasn't easy. But I had to take, I took like English 101. I took. I took Spanish at the local community college. My, I had a partner for a project. She was 16 and a high school student. That was my partner. It was pretty funny. Okay, this is unbelievable. And I mean, we have so much to talk about, but now that we started here, I found something online I really want people to see. And it blew me away because it's exactly what we're talking about. I want everybody to see this. this ah, is- that's funny. Can, let me just show this. It's a, like a minute 45. Well, how okay. you're using your life now. It blows me away. I re- People come to me who know sort of what scales and what modes go over certain chords, and they want to expand their playing and maybe play a little more outside. I mean, the whole secret of jazz to me is uh, tension and resolution, tension and resolution. So for example, that, uh, that little run going up, I'm going F minor to A flat minor. And so I kind of thought of like an A7, maybe with a flat five, to get to the A flat minor, even though it's not written in the chart. You're playing a blues and eventually four bars later, you're going to wind up on an E flat seven. You have some freedom. You have four bars to get there, you know. (laughs) 
C diminished, right? Or easy way to sound cool. I like to see how you can construct uh, your improvisation using uh, either a scalar motion or a more arpeggiated motion. Really um, work on bringing out the melody and bringing out the top note or inner voice. Okay, can we please? <laughs> what, what? Listen, you don't even know what he's done in his life yet. And he's giving back in that way, making improv sound easy. First of all, technically, I know what you're saying, but that doesn't mean that I can do it. How do you make it accessible for students? Is it just fear of doing it? That keeps people back. Oh, you know what? It's it's so. The, the hardest thing is teaching something like that because I, I I think after all the years that you put in, you you it's just so uh, second nature that to actually analyze it and try and figure it out and pick a little morsel to share with someone and a lot of I mean, I'm looking at that. That was I think that was in a uh, edited little. Yeah, it was a, it was a minute class. 45. Yeah, I yeah. wanted to show people though yeah, yeah. what you No, but doing. I'm just saying, I'm just saying there's got to be and and I don't know that I've really uncovered yet, that yet, but to find the little nugget to share yes. with someone and hard to do and uh work in progress. Okay. Okay. So, I have so much more to ask you about. Okay, so l now let go back. I was I I uh, I was so excited that we were able to get on here. Yeah, right. So I'm I glad this worked. I know, I know. All right. So, now you you did Frankie Valen. Then you did Jerry Mulligan and Stan Getz. I mean, we, yes. what happened from Frank? That happened from Frankie Valley? No, remember, nothing to do you with Frankie Valley. Nothing ahead. to do with Frankie Valley. Okay, but didn't you, when I met you in 1980, yes. you had a solo album that had just come out. Right. What was that called? Well, it depends which one. I had a solo piano record. I played at, like, uh, I did at Carnegie Recital Hall, solo piano record. That was really my first record on a Japanese label for the Newport Jazz Festival. I think that was before the one you're, you're thinking of. The other, that other one was on a division of Wyndham Hill called uh, Magenta. And still, it's one of those things where when you start out, and you, you've just been writing songs and writing songs. And, writing, and then all of a sudden you get a record deal. And it's like, you got all these great material. 11 yes. That, wow, my watch, is, my watch, my watch thinks uh -oh. I'm Your watch I'm is talking to you? It is. Oh, my God. He's giving you our heart rate. This is a one time. Listen, everybody. We're getting Mitchell Foreman's heart rate. <laughs> it's too high. I'm not doing anything. It shouldn't be that high. Uh, you, you're a little nervous, maybe. I don't know. You're excited. Maybe. I, I'm, I'm excited. excited. Um, yeah, I'm trying to shut it off. You can but... silence Siri now, though. Um, that's not... That's not... <laughs> anyway, um, I'll figure it out. Here we go. Done. Okay. All right. So, so okay, the one that I'm talking about, what was it called? Train it of was... Thought. Train of Thought. Thank right. you. Go ahead. So anyway, that's it was, when I met you. Yeah, right. It was. It was. It had amazing people. It had Michael Brecker, Peter Erskine. Yes. It was good and really good compositions, if I might say so. And now my phone's making noises. Everything's making noises. Uh, <laughs> I was looking for a little bit of train of thought on Apple Music, thinking we could put some under the. I don't underscore. think you could find it from Apple. It can, I Apple can't Apple. find it. You know, but you anyway. look on YouTube. YouTube on YouTube. YouTube. I'll look on YouTube. Fine. Um, okay. But anyway, so go ahead. You had these amazing people. Michael Brecker, God rest his soul. We had Peter Erskine. Who else did was yeah. on the, uh, on the Mark record? Johnson was on there. And, uh, and Tom Barney, who I think, you do you know him? Uh, yes, didn't of he, course. Is didn't Tom he play on around? some shows? Yeah, I thought he played on a lot of like Broadway shows for. Yeah, Tom Barney, I knew. 10, yeah. 20 years or something like that. Anyway. But I so know. Yeah, keep going. That was a long time ago. And that record came out. And, and um. Then I, but that was sort of, I had a little side career as that. In the, in the meantime, too, I was deep in the New York, like, jingle studio land. Right. We both were. We yeah. both were in jingle studio land. That's right. 
it was, it was an amazing, for me, it was an amazing time and very, um, uh, uh, like an incubator for how to play in time, how to read, how to make, the, the, the gig was really how to tell jokes and hang. I remember some of those, some of those sessions would be, they, they'd book you for like, it was an out, what was it? Like possible 20, like. Right. Remember, remember there was a restaurant called yeah. Possi yeah, possible yeah. 20. We possible would all sit 20. there. There'd be phone. We, there were no cell phones. There were phones right. at the table yeah. and you would get a call from your uh, service. Radio saying, registry. You were probably on a different one. <laughs> no, I was on artist service, but right. you were right, on radio right. registry and they said, right. you have an hour with the possible of 20 for Coca-Cola at right. such and such a studio. Can you do it? Yes. And you'd race over. Right. So, but anyway, the, those days were like, I, the people I played with were in the bands were amazing. And I kind of got in when I was young. Um, Wayne Cohen, actually, remember him? <gasps> Wayne got me Cohen. In. I remember him. He, what, he, well, he worked for what? One of H -E -A. the H-E-A. H-E-A. <laughs> I haven't heard these names in so long. Susan Hamilton, right? Mick DeMinnow. Uh, right. Jake Holmes. Hot, uh, Al how, Gorgoni. Those were my employers. Anyway. Shout out to all these amazing people who hired us for jingles in the days when we were doing jingles. And Mitchell, tell them you had like a service that carded your oh, synth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Remember? Because it was the early days of synthesizers and you were, you were treated royally. Because all, right. all of a sudden you could do anything for them. You and could they do were, they'd Go for a while because I started getting other gigs and I started traveling. And I, like Wayne Shorter I did and John McLaughlin and a lot Stop. of- Stop! Did you see the Wayne Shorter documentary? I just saw that. And I went to his memorial service at the Buddhist temple in uh, Santa Monica. It was amazing. Some pe and Herbie, just sp so many people spoke so beautifully about Wayne. What a life. If anybody hasn't seen it, is it on Prime Video? Where is it? I think it was on, yeah, I think it's It's called Prime. Zero Gravity. Zero Gravity, yeah. It's amazing. And it's about Wayne Shorter. So- Let's stop here for a minute because we need to honor this person. So playing with Wayne Shorter, give me any kind of a sign of a, an experience you want to give us, just one. Uh, sure. Uh, one thing was no matter what you did, how the travel was, Wayne was always 100% there. You could have traveled all day, no sleep. He'd like pick up the horn. Someone shared a story at the, at the service where he was some festival in the middle of Finland or somewhere, I think it was Finland, and his right. horns didn't make it to the gig. And oh. someone said, oh, I, a doctor has like a horn. And he picked it, it was like shiny green, not a great horn. And his wife shared the story that he never even said, hey, I'm playing on a crap horn. This isn't my best. She said he just like dialed it in and did, did amazing, like played things that he never would have played before on a different horn and no excuses and just, so he was just fully and a hundred percent present all the time. Okay. Also the only comment, never a comment about the music. The only thing he's really into movies, which you'll see if you watch this film, the documentary, right? Oh, you must, you must see this documentary. No, but he's you remember really how he was. And action a, figures. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but at the time, the only. We what happened had, to Chuck Loeb. Yeah. He passed away. I know. But what but, uh, happened? I didn't even know when, when uh, it happened. It was been a while. You don't have to give me the details. Just right, tell right. me what you... No, it was you, a long while ago. And you know what? I just listened. I'm playing. We had a band called Metro. And, um, and we must have done five or six records, maybe more. And every right. record, every gig was a diff always the same three guys, me, Chuck, and a German drummer named Wolfgang Hoffner. And every right. record was a different bass player. It was like Spinal Tap. <laughs> with the drummers blowing up. <laughs> and those of you, we're old. If you don't know what Spinal Tap was, you gotta go watch the movie now. <laughs> you know, I found Train of Thought. What's your favorite one we can have just going on quietly underneath you? Uh, you could play, I, li I like, uh, I'm Wonderama is good. That's the opening Wonderama. one. Okay. And a lot of drummers will know the opening drum lick. Okay, all right, good. that's great. Blocka, um, block boom, boom. Oh, wow. Okay. Let's see what happens here. Wonderama. Okay. Let me see if there's that works. Uncle, there's Andy Girls, there's Train of Milton, Wonderama. There it That's is. Wonderama. Yeah, it was funky. I do yeah, remember funky, this. Yeah. So that was just me and Peter. I'm playing synth bass. And then I played like a synth guitar on top of that coming up. I, I just I, hold on one second. Yeah. 
He's playing his ass off, and so are you. Yeah, but that's a synth guitar. It sounds pretty good. It does. And that was 1980, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to keep this playing underneath this whole thing. Cause hey, hold. Hey, go ahead. What do you I, need? I, give me one second. Can I mute myself? All right, myself I'm going to play this and I'm going to talk. Okay, how do I mute myself? You don't have to mute yourself. I'll mute you. Okay, so here's the story. This is Mitchell Foreman playing Wonderama in like the 80s. He's playing synth guitar. What I'd love to do is like the solo piano too, to show people. Sure. So what what do you think for solo piano I would show people? Uh, I don't know, from what that, do you got available? Oh, no, from this I, I'm on YouTube. I can oh. do anything. Because I want to juxtapose. I just want that Keith Jarrett-y thing, because you were very influenced by Keith Jarrett. Is I that true? Keith, this is true. Well, here's the thing. When I think about it, if I look over the arc of my learning, I would always, I found one piano player to emulate and then moved on. I started with Bill, by the way, I watched the Bill Evans documentary as well. Oh, I got to see that. I got to see that. It's, it's totally uh, a, a different vibe from the Wayne Shorter one, but. Right. It's a, it's a little tragic in a way, but amazing. Amazing that both of the dedication they had to their art, you know? Yes, yes. Anyway, I was just so into, into I think the order that I went was Bill Evans, M McCoy Tyner, uh, Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, Keith Jarrett. Those five. Wow, you remember your order. I think that, I think that was the order. <laughs> but really into it. Like, and you mentioned Keith Jarrett. I remember one, I was playing with Mulligan. I was really into Keith Jarrett. And Keith Jarrett came to a gig and was sitting like in the front row. <laughs> and I was, kept thinking, oh, I can't play that. Like, that's Keith. I can't play that. That's Keith. I got I to gotta edit. You were. Mark. I do remember, the, the, for those of you that are music nerds, I remember what exactly was, was what, that you took from Keith that you were influenced by, which is, the triple and quadruple glisses, but to get to the, you know to get to the um, melody, like all right, it was so all these, like grace notes and grace notes, grace notes and climbing <laughs> to notes. Anyway, hey, we are, so uh, you're looking for something to play. I don't know what would be appropriate. I have huh? here. I have nice piano solo from Mitchell Foreman in concert. I don't think that would it, be it. No, no, that's Let's probably see what not it a. Is. No. Uh, you can play that. Yeah. So this is what we're talking about. So you just heard him. Listen just for a minute. There you go. I just love your solo piano stuff. How much of it is improvised? How much of it is composed? I think that melody and the chords were composed and then I just messed around. I had a little yes. bit of like a solo piano career for a minute. You yeah. did, but that's, I think, if I was being totally honest, is when I kind of saw you. Mm. Because everything else is beautiful and one, you hear the little yeah. Do you hear what I'm talking about? Okay, so does everybody understand what I'm talking about here? This is a person who can sit down like this and play solo piano, but also can play in a band and groove his ass off. Okay, we don't have to. Okay, I'm going to keep this playing. I just love this. Okay, okay thanks, underneath. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you a few other things. So now we go, I'm going to skip ahead. We go, uh, you're an incredible studio musician. Then you meet John McLaughlin. What happened with Mahavishnu? Because I kind of remember that from your past. But I think it's the other way. I think I did... John McLaughlin, how did I get John? Oh, Bill Evans. How did you get John McLaughlin? Bill Evans, Bill Evans called me, was doing a record in Paris, and Bill Evans had, uh, he, he sort of wanted, he want, asked me, wanted me to join the band. Okay. For, for whatever reason. And it was right when they were doing a record, McLaughlin calls and said, hey, can you come like tomorrow to Paris? And I kind of threw everything away and got there in about two days and played on the record with Billy Cobham was in the band at the time. Oh! And uh, John, John, a Swedish bass player named Jonas Helberg and Bill. Oh. And then uh, 
And then uh, Billy left the band after when we started touring and Danny Gottlieb played in the band. Danny Gottlieb, yes! I know Danny. So uh, anyway, so and that lasted for a couple of years and, and it was amazing. John was amazing, an amazing guy, very uh, gracious, very good. I remember he was super, he was good at everything he did. He'd right. be like, oh, you want to play darts? And he'd be like, amazing. You want to play pool? Amazing. You want to go off the high diving board? He'd be like. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to go through this quick, and then we're going to go back to childhood real quick. We only okay. have a few more minutes, so I, okay. do, I just want to. All right. So now. All right. So you got John McLaughlin. And then you got you did Wayne Shorter. And I then, left John to go to Wayne. It was Wayne Shorter. Right. Yeah. And, and then you worked with John Schofield, Mike Stern. Janice Siegel from uh, Manhattan, Transfer. Manhattan Transfer, right? Dave Samuels, Diane Shore, Gary Burton, Pat Matheny, Simon Phillips, Freddie Hubbard. Okay. And Ricky Lee Jones. Let's stop there. So you're doing all this jazz stuff. And then all of a sudden, did you get to like do stuff with kind of pop artists of the time? I didn't do much with pop artists. And Ricky Lee Jones was okay. really a one, one, I think she was producing one some thing. once a singer. So through All right. So you stayed in the jazz world. Okay. And then my question now is, there's a quote here from a guy named Cliff Tinder. Is that his name? Yeah, I think. He, Musician he magazine. Musician a magazine. pianist and composer of formidable technical facilities, able to integrate poignantly introspective and pessimistic feelings, I can't even say it, into sophisticated structures that cohere so naturally, it's easy to overlook their inherent complexity and formal logic. And to me, what he's saying is, you are making things accessible. Like, I can kind of... I feel like this is accessible in some way. Like, I'm not listening to something I don't understand. Even if I'm not a jazzer, quote unquote. That's so Keith Jarrett, what you picked right there. It's, like, ba it's like bad Keith Jarrett, unfortunately. I'd stop it. <laughs> okay, okay, now I want to go back. Now let's go back to childhood because we don't, I want to cover everything. So here okay. you are. You are at what age when you realize I want to play the piano? Uh, seven, I'll tell the story, like, as I recall my parents telling it, was that they had a toy organ. I still, I wish I had it. I don't know where it just disappeared. Like an m &E, brown, two octave little toy. And I would play along like with the radio. And my, we had the aunt that's not really an aunt who was like a concert pianist, but she was, you know, not just a friend of the family. And she came over and said, you know, he's sort of like playing with the reason, not just fucking around. Sorry, I don't know language. Oh, no, you can show. say whatever you want. And um, the last show. The last show, what could happen? They kick you <laughs> off. <Nothing. laughs> so, um, and, and, and I encouraged, my parents had just moved to Long Island and had like a big house with empty rooms. And they said, okay, we're going to buy, it. they bought a baby grand piano to fill the room, gave me piano lessons and I just took to it. So. That's how it okay. So, how quickly did you progress? Like my mother said, she took the piano lessons with me just in case I wanted to quit. But I was ahead like within three lessons and she had right. to stop taking. Um, I, I think I progressed fairly quickly. I, I didn't really put in the time and energy because I could fake it and get through it, you know? Oh, because so, your ear is so good. Uh, yeah, and I could sight read really well. Even as that's the part that blows me away. Why did, did you never want to be in a Broadway pit? Cause you know, I took that trajectory because you could have done it, but who cares? Yeah, no, when I, artist. when I did it, when I, when that, at the time I was in New York, it was sort of like the I last think, stop. Yeah. Broadway was, if you were doing jingles, you didn't do Broadway. And then that's Broadway exactly became, right. then Broadway replaced jingles. I think that's right. So, That's what happened. And yeah. then it was, it was the six figure job. Everybody wanted to have. Right, right, it was so right. true. Yeah. Uh, when the residuals went out the window. Okay. So solo career wise. Now, then you move from New York. Now you did, you, you have kids now that are, that are like one of your kids. Isn't he like has a lot of followers and does really successful in music. What's his name? Let's, his, let's promote him. His name him. is Ellis Foreman and on spot. He's one of the few people I know that makes money off Spotify. He's like gazillion. Ellis goes, gets applause. No, but he goes by he goes by middle school. <gasps> middle school. He has a name. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, middle school. And check it out. It's good. Like on Spotify, it's 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 good. And so uh, he, my, 
he's, he's very doing very very well in the music business. My daughter right. also is Nina. She's in a band called Morning Forever and plays bass and like somehow wound up producing and engine like mixing the records, which is pretty funny. And she's also a visual artist and a painter. Okay, so. that's amazing. First of all, I did not know about your daughter. I knew about your son. Right. The ages, please. Ages of both. 20, Nina is 24, Ellis is 27. Okay. Now you get to the point, you've soloed, you play with amazing people, and you decide, it. what made you go into the whole teaching thing? What made you say, teaching now was, I need- Teaching was much later. Much, much, much later. later. Okay. Much, much later. Very so, recent. Okay. Okay, so you decided now what happened after that whole you have your own record deal still or do you put things out in your no, own No, I actually I haven't I haven't done a record in quite a while. But you've been but doing I, this smooth jazz thing. I did the smooth jazz thing for a little too long where I you know and you know it's it's funny even like <laughs> <laughs> No, a I, little- I, so, sometimes things just fall in one's lap and and I, I'm at my, and it was fun, and it was super. And it was fun. I played with great guys, and then I got out of that. And and even the teaching thing, I ran into someone who was head of a uh, music dep- of the piano department at a local college, and she said, "Do you want to teach at the school?" I said, "Yes," and that's turned into maybe eight, nine years of teaching at the school. Yeah, that is so great. Los Angeles College of Music. I took the summer off, and it's starting again in a week, and I'm like, ah. Oh, now you have to make up your own little syllabus and everything? For some things, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, so in the few, like right now, you, you stopped, you just teaching, you don't want to tour with anybody or anything. You're kind of like settled. You moved to the West Coast, I should say, because yep. I knew you when you were in New York. And you moved yes. a long time ago. You moved there. a long time ago, yeah. 91 right. or something like that. Okay. What are these... <laughs> There's a l- whole list of things that I found on this discography, this amazing discography. One is, why does it say, oh, oh, Marcy's Jazz. Is Marcy's that Jazz, your- that was my record label. That's what I want to ask right. about. And there's Puzzle, Sing Along with Mitch, which I find hysterical. Does yeah. anybody know the reference? I don't know. Yeah, Have you listened to that? No, and that's what I was going to ask you about. Should we find that? You should find Sing Along with Mitch and play Chuck Loeb's Daughter or singing Celebrate Me Home. Okay, let's see if we can find this, Sing Along with Mitch. That is on, That would be on Apple or music or something. Okay, because when we do Sing Along with Mitch, actually Mitch Miller comes up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but... <laughs> yeah, I know. All right, so we'll talk about that. Um, and you want to set it up for us? Sure. At the time I did, I had been working with different singers and I did a record of just playing piano with, I think, five or six singers, solo piano, different singers. One of them is Chuck Loeb's daughter, Lizzie Loeb. Oh, wait a minute. You do Dear Prudence on here? Yeah, that's good, too, with Arnold McCullough. Do you know him? Yes. Can we play a little of Dear Prudence? Sure, if you want. Oh, my God. But you got to play Lizzie's, too. I will. Because I love when you take things like this I love this Dear Prudence Mitchell Look at you too Won't you come out to play See what I mean by you can make it Dear Prudence He was such a He sang jingles like crazy Arnold McCuller He sang on every album brand new day The sun is up, the sky is blue, it's beautiful, and so are you, dear Prudence. Oh, yes! I love when you do that. Won't you come out to play? (laughs) Okay, stop. You should play more. It gets better, almost. He does some harmonies. I know. Should we keep going with that one? Keep going. It's good. Okay. Well, no, no, put, I put, like when you get excited. No, we got to keep. I like. And you. Oh, see that? Breathe. Dear Prudence. Open up. 
of your I love what you do. See the sunny sky. Please, everybody, get this by this. No. The wind is low, the birds will sing, that you are part of everything, dear prudence. Won't you open up your eyes and look around, around? Getting such a treat here. Dear Prudence, you've changed the Beatles. <laughs> Stop it. Let hey, go to the other song. Okay, okay. Can go I to... just say, please, I, 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 this is my last show and I knew it was going to be a friggin' great one. I just knew it. All right, what's the other song? You got to play, you got to play, actually, a lot of them are good on there, but play Lizzie Lo Celebrate Me Home. Celebrate Me Home. That's, this is, okay, let's set it up. It's, it's Chuck Loeb's daughter yeah. singing. Yeah. It's your, it's your arrangement of Celebrate Me Home, and it's from the album uh, Sing Along with Mitch, which is a great title for an album. Please go to Apple Music and download this. Here we go. The harmony. All I always the payoff is the harmonies. I an easy highway, traveling where the westerly winds can't fly. Somebody tried to tell me, but the man forgot to tell me why. And I've got to count on being gone. Come on, woman. Come on, daddy. Everybody, please. Okay, I'm uh, sorry. En enough about this. Hey, I see a, there's a note. There's a lot of good song, a lot of good singers on that record. So, I see a note. Someone's writing. Who do you wish you could have played with? Yes, that's Chris Rossetti asking the question. Please answer. So, you the know what? Oh, by so, the way, audience, now is your time to ask questions. Go ahead. So I never got to play with Miles, and I, I'm, <sighs> and 
But I, when I was playing with McLaughlin, we would share the bill, like a lot of festivals where we'd open for him or play before. He'd be around a lot. So I would talk to him a little bit. My story, I actually went to his house, his apartment in New York with John once. I think Nancy went with me, if I remember correctly. Oh, our friend Nancy. Yeah. Yes, Nancy. So, but um, I, I did get a phone call from him once. I was living in New York and he called from... California, and it was, he called me Michael. That's how close we were. He goes, Yo, Michael, how do you tune a bass? And I said, And it was really late at night. And I said, I think it's EADG. He said, Okay, thanks. Hung up the phone. That was my <laughs> That's a great story. phone conversation with Miles. Um, I wish I would have played with Steely Dan as well. Oh, God. And other than that, I'm pretty happy. Yeah, you've played with. <laughs> This is amazing. All right. So look, here we are. This was our last show. Does anybody else? Oh, there's, I'm looking at questions. Oh, okay. so I, I don't see, see them. Yeah. But how did you see that one? I don't know. I see a little list on, on the left side. A little list on the left side. Oh, uh, well, maybe I have to scroll up to see that. I'm not sure. Anyway. No. All right. So look, here's what we did. We had our final show on Fireside and I, I want to know, like, for the future. Uh, Martha Barsha was watching us. I wonder if she's there anymore. It doesn't really have it. So, Deb, Barsha. what will you do in the future? What do you mean, what will I do? Where, where, where you uh, that's a good show. question. I think I'm going to change platforms, and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. I don't know what Chris Rossetti is doing, if he's still here. I, Chris had a show every single morning called The Antidepressant of the Day, and he would give us – it was a 15-minute show – and he would give us just this incredible thing for 15 minutes of mm. the antidepressant of the day. And he's been on this platform longer than I have. I wonder what Chris is doing. We don't know what he's doing. Um, but anyway, I want to know what you're going to be doing. You'll be teaching still, right? I'm teaching. I tell you, one thing I have to share is I've become friends with Alan Bergman. <gasps> oh, like, oh, my God. The great lyricist from Alan and Marilyn I, Bergman. I, I was invited to his 98th birthday party and I had just been exposed to someone with COVID. So I didn't go to the party. Lucky for me, cause I wound up getting it. And, and you're better I, now. Better I know. Now. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm going to see him tomorrow. I'm going over to his house. He's still, he writes every day. He's working on songs from Michelle Legrand. Like Mich he gives, I get, I get, and Michelle Legrand passed away maybe two years ago. Yeah. So Alan yeah. sends me Michelle Legrand's chicken, writing like pretty sloppily handwritten songs and makes me play them for him. And then he tries, puts lyrics on them. And so he's still work tomorrow. I'm going over his house with some recording equipment. I'm going to record him singing a new song that he's written to Michelle Legrand things. All right. This is, this is amazing. I am blown away. Uh, Tierney Sutton. I see us on this album, which recorded one of the, my songs, I didn't know if you knew that. <laughs> Tierney, I wrote a lyric to a Bevan Oh, right, 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 yeah, you know, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, you told me that. Yeah. And here, speaking about Michelle Legrand, I mean, yeah, and um, Alan and Marilyn Bergman. Oh, what about this? this from the album? And we'll go out with this and just allow it to play for a minute. We might be upset with, with YouTube playing this because they don't allow me and we're simulcasting on YouTube. But this is what are you doing the rest of your life? And we'll just hear a little bit because I'm going to get in trouble. Because I'm playing Apple Tunes on YouTube. What are you doing the rest of your life? North and South and East and West of your life. That look on your face. I have only one request of your life that you spend it all with me. All the seasons and the times of your days All the 
nickels and the dimes of your days. Okay, since this is an interview show, I can't just let it play, but I do want to thank you uh, thanks, so much Deb. for being here. It means so much for my last show that you were here and you did this. Thanks, sweetheart. And hey, I, I, Deb, can I interrupt ahead. you for one second? Just listening to that, I, I was thinking, and I try to, in, like when I was teaching some students, I would say when you're accompanying a singer, think of them as like that you have an extra pinky on your right hand and you, they're going to, you're, they're playing, but you're so involved in it that their note is, how are you supporting that note with what you're playing? It's like a, Oh my God, I love that. We have one person who wants to maybe come up and say hello, which is Martha Barsha. I've oh invited her <laughs> right. and then we'll go. Um, Martha, do you want to, do you want to say hello to us? I'll unmute your microphone. Where are you? Can you say anything? Um, say hello. Yeah. Do you um, have one yeah. thing to say to Mitchell? Hello. Yes. Love you, uh, thanks, and you make Martha. me feel young. You have two, two kids starting off in music, and uh, I love where you both went. And uh, love you both, and uh, I'm glad you had a nice family. <laughs> thanks, Martha. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's clapping. Mitchell Foreman. Tova. Shana ah, Tova, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, for coming to the show, my last show. And I have just been here with a person that I know and love. And you did it. You did it. And thank you. And goodbye, everybody. Farewell. Mitchell Foreman, any last thing you want to say to us? The biggest part of my life now is kite surfing. It's all I do. I'm going to go kite surfing. <laughs> I have a gig in a little while. I'm going to go set up for the, I'm going to go, go to the beach, bring my gear to the beach, set it up, then go set up for the gig. And after sound check, go kite surfing and then try and make it back for the gig. Yay. Thank you everybody for these.